नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू एपिसोड सिक्स ऑफ Pustaka Lok A Light of a Book Today's discussion of the book will be on the book titled Cartographer by Mr Mohan Rana from England To commence today's program I would like to invite Mr Mohan Rana the author of the book Cartographer to render his remarks just a little background on mr mohan rana mr mohan rana is a hindi poet who grew up and studied in delhi and now lives in bath england he writes poems exploring themes of identity truth memories and nature he has published eight poetry collections in hindi such as jagha jaise janam koi darwaza uh, subha ki dhak is store par पत्थर हो जाएगी नदी धूप के अंधेरे में रेत के फूल शीश अनेक ही पब्लिश बाई लिंग इंक्लूड पोम्स विद ट्रांसलेशन ट्रांसलेशन बाय एंड लूसी रोजनस्टेन एंड विहेर ए चैप बुक ऑफ स्पेनिश ट्रांसलेशन विद ईच बुक इन हिज रेपुटेशन एज ए डायस और पोर्ट हैज ग्रो Brevity, clarity, and precision are defining characteristics of Mohan Rana Ji's poetry. The poet and critic Nand Kishore Acharya has written that amongst the new generation of Hindi poets, the poetry of Mr. Mohan Rana stands alone. It defies his categorization. However, its refusal to put into any ideology doesn't mean that Mohan Rana Ji's poetry shies away from thinking. But it is that knows the difference between thinking in verse and thinking about poetry. For Mohan Rana Ji, the poetic process in itself is also a thought process. Today, we welcome Mr. Mohan Rana for his remarks. Yeah. Okay. Namaste. Uh, my greetings to everyone. who is present here in this virtual space to discuss my poetry collection the cartographer i'm thankful to the director uh, of the swami vivekananda center at durban uh, chaitanya ji uh, who kindly inviting me to participate in this program um i prepared a a brief statement uh, uh sushri has already explained a little bit about me and so i won't add more to it i'll just take uh, or a few notes from this statement i've been writing uh, and publishing actively since 1986 i i grew up and studied in delhi and worked as a freelance writer uh, for newspapers and magazines uh now i live in bath england and uh, as sushti has given detail that i published eight poetry collections in poetry it's bilingual even a triangle trilingual uh, poetry collection so and uh, my poems have been translated into uh english spanish and various european and indian languages my poems uh, explore existential existential themes of identity truth memories and nature while searching for my own in a voice and mapping the geography of a poetic language i inhabit a landscape and climate in which hindi is a silent is silent on the surface but is a voice of another within after living within english geography for many years it could be assumed that english has consumed me all of me that i write poems and dream in english as as a poet once asked me that do you do you dream in english nowadays yet that is not the case i write in the functional language of my mind in language if language is a river mine has become a river that has no visible presence it is now an underground stream 
it only becomes visible in the words on the paper. The coordinates of this language river are not fixed latitude. They are transient. They travel with me from place to place. Sometimes the elements of a landscape that inspires me cannot be described by equivalent words in Hindi. Hence, I have to engineer a vocabulary that is visual, that is meaningful to someone who reads the poem far away in India. Now I would like to talk a little bit about this collection. This uh, small poetry collection is, is a work in progress still. Uh, it started, uh, we started working, I would say around 2009. And in late 2009, I, Lucy and Bernard, uh, we were brought together to translate 10 poems uh, for a poetry reading in London uh, in White, at White Chapel Gallery. Uh, uh, and uh, we had a reading in February 2010 of these 10 poems. And, uh, and then after that, we translated uh, three more poems. But a year later, then a, a book was published, a small chat book. It's called The Poems. It's a bilingual book. And uh, then there's a big gap of almost 10 years now. And then uh, in 2019, we, we brought back together again into the same uh, setting to do uh, the translations of a few more poems. So we translate, we, I selected seven poems and we translated further, uh, you know, further on working on those poems. And uh, then in January last year, we have this uh, manuscript. And then in November, we have, we finally had a, a book called The Cartographer. But still, uh, because there are many poems we had we left out. And ho I hope that, it, <laughs> I don't know, we'll take, it might take another 10 years probably to bring another uh, poetry collection. Uh, I feel very humbled to be here in this virtual space to talk about myself or about the book. And uh, I'm very thankful to be in your company. Uh, I'm basically here to listen to what you say about the book or uh, poetry. So I thank you very much for your time and being here. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohan Rana, for taking us through that journey of the book, A Cartographer. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Ram Prashad Bhatt, a faculty member from the University of Hamburg in Germany. We welcome Dr. Ram Prashad Bhatt for his remarks today. Can you hear me? So, thanks a lot. Uh, greetings to everyone now. And I'm humbled to be invited to this August gathering here, especially about uh, the poetry of Mohan I congratulate the organizers, the poet himself, and the marvelous translators, and the publisher as well. I find this collection of poetry really wonderful. And I'm, I'm amazed to see that since I know Rana since past few years and his poetry, that they have selected wonderful poems. So once again, congratulations and thanks at the same time. More Rana's quality and virtue that I find most important in the poetry or poetry writing is his selection of words. Because 
It is the words that conveys the message of any author, any writer, and more importantly so in poetry. We talk about three different virtues of any word that is avida or lachana and vyanjana is metaphorical language that Rana is using very often. So I will be touching upon a few ideas or few elements that I came across to this collection of poetry. The first one is the time. And he usually uses the you know, elements, uh, the five elements that we all know, whether it's in Ayurveda, it's in yoga or in other knowledge system of the world. And then the marvelous use of that unseen, uh, you know, pronoun, I. And finally, I'll be maybe trying to put forth the, or trying to understand Donna's, you know, way of writing his poetry, etc. Is it really a transcendental way of you know, conveying your message? Moon Rana is certainly for me and for many of my colleagues, I believe, an important Hindi author who is compelling and probably the only important poet among diaspora Hindi writers or Hindi authors. Um, he incorporates or conglomates the East and the West at the level of the word uses, the philosophy and cultural traditions. And his poetry consistently uses or has a human appeal throughout. And that's what makes him really precious. Poet Mohan Rana, in his thoughts, seem to be surrounding the life philosophy or the way the traditional Indian knowledge system observes and adapts to the nature and her influences on human body. In other, in other words, if I may say so, human physical and transcendental relationship with the nature and its elements, the mother nature, influences the human body, mind, and psyche. And this shows the subtlety of his intricate metaphysical type of poems. Alison Brackenbury has rightly pointed out that Rana is very often concerned with memory and time. And it is, I believe, the memory and time that is the central a kind of uh, you know, issue in his poetry. Rana's writing is sensitive to the different phases and lights of the day, to the seasons throughout the year, times, and he travels through time, I must say, and the echoes of the voices are heard to the life of a vast and not always comfortable universe. And with that, I mean whatever happens around us or surrounding life. The temporalities usually collapses, but the continuity of process remains, just like the notion of time in Indian, process, in Indian philosophy. That means when we look at the philosophy of time in the Western world, we travel from point A to point B. But when we talk about the philosophy of time in Eastern philosophy, I mean particularly Indian philosophy, it is never ending, it's round. It travels from, you know, it's never ending. It may change its course, it may change its path, but it is never ending. And that's what is happening here as well. Thus, Rana seems to be very much interested in the philosophy of time and the magnificent virtue of water in its various forms. The light, that by means fire, Air, wind, very often we read this uh, noun there, and Gaia, the mother earth, and the ether, Akas. 
So this uh, really reminds me of uh, the notion of, uh, you know, this uh, Panjabhuta in uh, Indian traditions, that life is surrounding around these Panti, these elements, and that's what our relation to Mother Nature is. This unique play of time and coining the interrelationship of the time with the time itself, that means the past and the future, can't even you know, go parallel into each other. And he remarkably uses like, you know, the, the, the words or the sentences like, the words like, Ata hua ati, so, which has never, not yet come. The, the past has not yet come or it's, it's still coming. So the future, which is, which we are living already, but we still don't know it. We still are looking for that information. And if in English, uh, as the past approached, the future, even when you lived it or remains to be seen, that is in his book, uh, this collection of poetry is number 40, 40. Sometimes he seems to be diving into the past that is yet to come and into the future that is there, but he is yet to experience it. So this unique interplay is there. And similarly, he uses, uh, you know, words, words like I dry the words in the rain, page 38, 39, and Tisra perhaps this remarkable use of the time unit that is very often used in Indian knowledge system, classical knowledge system, by the way. And it is divided. It can be the daytime and it can be the evening, night time, both. Pahar is uh, this, uh, in, in Indian traditional knowledge system, has important uh, place. And since I am a uh, student of oral tradition of India, I do, you know, come across to this kind of terminologies all over India, especially in the Himalayas and also in the South. So this, for me, kind of brings the rural or the knowledge system, the traditional knowledge system to the, you know, the so-called modern societies as well. So I try to put them, you know, bring them in that perception. The time philosophy, as I said earlier, you know, of the Western and the Eastern, he are also to be seen in his poems. He develops or delves, by the way, into the faith and ritual of transcendental truthfulness and pays his homage to the time. The poet, Saint Kabir, if you, some of us may know, he also indulges in this term or uses this term. <laughs> He says, Panch Pahar Dhande Gaye, Teen Pahar Gaye Sur, Ek Pahar Harinam Bin Mukti Kaise Ho. You went to work for five Pahars. By the way, one Pahar is, is uh, consisting three hours. So five Pahars would mean 15 hours you are working, and you still have the rest of the Pahars of the hours. How will you attain the salvation? That And Kavir, of course, talks also about the you know, the, the existence of humans and the you know, br brotherhood. Rana himself also related, relates his own identity, I believe, to the time. Because he finds himself between the lines. He says, Pantiyo ke beech anupastitho tum e khamosh pahicha. Jese bhatatte badalo me anupastit barish. Between the lines, it's you that's absent, but the silent presence, just as the rain is absent in the passing clouds. And that's the page number in cartographer, page number 5252. He transverses through the geography as he himself said a bit earlier, a nature of the places and built his special boundaries to them. I remember of reading his presence in Lisbon, He's talking about the, uh, I think, passive, uh, the ocean, talking about the rivers, talking about the waters. And by the way, 
in Indian knowledge system, it's you will be amazed to know. We have almost 70 different terms for water. 70 different terms for water in Sanskrit literature. She can find the peace in crowded daily, but remains restless in the woods of England. What does it mean? This means his association to the time is special. The different time zones influences him and his creativity as well. In a private discussion, Rana admitted that she is usually writing his poetry after midnight and that he also expresses in one of his poetry. In India, he may be, you know, writing poetry made in the, on the street of Delhi. <laughs> that was the case probably when he met, when he started writing in the 80s, especially the office of, Nava, uh, I think, this Jansatta and, uh, you know, meeting the important poets like Manglesh Kabal and others, and he's starting his writing. And therefore, he calls there is something in the air in some of his writings it will appear. So, there is another aspect to that. And that is, as I said earlier, the pronoun I or you. What is this you exactly? This is rather important to understand the Eastern languages, Eastern uh, cultural, culture as well because the uses of you is rather different. And that I say with authority because of the uses of in Indian languages, for example, accusative words or the medio passive words, for example, things happen themselves. The door opens itself or something happens. That is very much the case in Indian languages. And I believe that is that is why it is coming here. The you, as Blackenberry also pointed out, the person addressed in Rana's poetry, is it the lover or is it a friend or is it somebody else? You know, see, notice, notice it's really identified. Indeed, it cannot be identified in Western languages because in the Western languages, we really need a subject here. Whereas in Indian languages, it is not true. And this is one area where we really need to be very careful in translation because we do not find such parallels. It is sometimes I feel that someone that the poet is addressing or it is the poet himself, or maybe it is time or the soul of the poet and the poetry. And I believe He's talking about the poetry, the soul of the poetry, that he becomes himself in some ways or the other. We should not, we should, we can, we should not forget that even in Sufi poetry, we have such kind of ideas that you know the person is always third gender. It's not, not neither. I mean, never female. The use of an accusative verb or medio passive, as I said earlier, is a brilliant example of this idea, where things for which the life or the forces are independently active and need to need no mediator, no doer itself. And that's why he uses chalti sari rat. Throughout the night, the night remains restless. So in translation, of course, you need some subject here. But it is the, as far as I understand, it is the night itself that is restless. Page number 32, 33. The mook kara, the silent moon kept dwelling, the poet seems to be talking to his inner words. Page number 32, 33. Similarly, he uses badal gungunata hai kuch. The cloud comes something. So it reminds me of Kalidas, the great poet, Sanskrit poet of India. And Thakkar Bet Jati Hai Dopar. The midday gets tired and sit down. So <laughs> you can't express it in, of course, you know, midday gets tired and sit down. 
and maybe not in English probably not, or in German either. Page number 28-29. Activeness of the action and the activeness of the language that we call Mahashaki Sakriyata, that is a great virtue in Mohan Rana's poetry. He uses such constructions to mirror or to reflect the unseen, the bhavatit that we call, the transcendental. I ought to believe that Rana is pretty much influenced by the philosophy of the great Indian philosopher, Arvindo. And I believe he has even visited his ashrams and he read his books, probably. Uh, this is my impression, by the way. And the famous authors, Hindi poets, for example, Shachidanand Vatsai Nagye, was also used as such kind, kind of uses. And even in Chayavad, the mystic period of in Hindi literature, we do find, for example, in Mahavadevi Verma, such kind of uses. And to extend, maybe to some extent, he may be also influenced by Mohan Rabra, uh, I mean, uh, Manglesh Rabral, who unfortunately died recently. And I know that he was working with him. So probably I, I think that's the idea where it's also Mohan Rana has been so elaborate. His language use seems to be a construct because for Mohan Rana, I think language is just a construct, a medium. Because, you know, he, he doesn't trust the language in that sense or the words of the people. But the same time, at the same time, he also feels that, uh, you know, the words are deceiving in many ways. Uh, Kavir also pointed out, or Kavir also, you know, wrote about this. Bhaka ma maha thagni hamizan. You know, the language is a kind of deceiving. And therefore, he says, Rana says, I mean, meri asta hai kavita, kavita me, kintu vishwas nahi raha bhasha par, jese nahi raha apne hatheli ki bhagya rekha. I have faith in poetry, but my trust in language is gone. Gone with the line of faith inscribed in my palm. This in this collection, that's page number 12 to 15. I think the title is of no fixed abode. In Hindi, it is Aniki. Wonderful. This is probably inspired also by Paryagata Ishopanisar, verse 8. This also reflects in yet another poem. Arth shabdo mein nahi tumare bhitar hai. The meaning isn't in the words. It is in you, the poem that is said and thought that connects me with you. That unseen, which means what connects the poet with the poetry is the nuance of his poetry. I will quickly finish. Uh, this. One more thing I would like to point out that the realism is not so much represented in Mohan Rana's work. And I think there are reasons for that. Maybe I can go into that sometime, you know, some, when, whenever we have time or in other seminar, whenever I organize or somebody else is organized. But certainly Mohan Rana beautifully addresses some issues of realism in his poetry. And one striking poet, poem in this collection I came across to, that was Koye We Bacho Ke Naam, Koye Bacho Ke Naam, To the Lost Children. The destruction of childhood or life is not limited to one place. And that is not only his original place where he grew up in Delhi or in India, but everywhere, wherever he goes. I think even in Balkan, he's also traveling to Croatia. He talks about, uh, you know, Portugal. He talks about in other poem, I mean. And uh, uh, also when he was in Germany, I think in Hamburg, he visited me. Then I saw that he has written some poetry also. He keeps confronting the humanity every time. 
and you know, remembering the tree, it's, uh, the, the clothes hanging on those tree, on the tree. Every time the tree loses its leaves, you know, and keep hiding the crimes behind ever growing leaves. So he's symbolizing, you know, when the tree leaves, the, you know, then the leaves are fallen, then the crime uh, that is committed to the children is appearing, and but uh, after some time it also disappears, and then the importance of these, the existence of the children becomes lower and lower. That that disappears. So it's of course a you know a, a pity state, a pity you know of the society or the problem in the society. He confronts the metaphor with the reality and vice versa. I may allow to read these few lines and I will finish with that. I want to write the lost children, those whose clothes hung from the branches of the mulberry tree getting smaller as the branches grew. The tree gets thicker and thicker. Until years later, I see this old tree bent over its own shadow. The clothes turn to shreds. Their memories mix in the wind, dissolve in water, sink under the seasons, fade like a forgotten coin. So you see, everywhere you see Rana, you know, talking about poetry and the poem and the life and the philosophy. Rana is certainly a poet who seeks, who searches that what is unseen, what is transcendental, what present and scattered around us, around life. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram Prashad Bhatt, for that insight on the book, The Cartographer, by Mr. Mohan Rana. Our next guest speaker is Ms. Minnie Gill, an assistant professor at the Department of English at the Sri Aurobindo College, University of Delhi, India. Today, we welcome Ms. Minnie Gill for her remarks. Namaskar. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Swami Vivekanand Cultural Center at Consulate General of India, Durban, and giving me the opportunity to talk about the book, which is very wonderful and uh, different uh, from the mainstream literature. I thank you. Uh, I congratulate Mohan Rana ji on uh, on his uh, on the publication of this book the cartographer i want to say a few words about the book actually when a poet writes he is thinking a way deeper than the words can convey poetry is not a linear writing it is multi-layer narrative which conveys more than a poet can think about creative zest of a person compels him to know about the unknown. Through the alleys of unknown, the poet tries to seek truth. Crossing over, the very first poem is a reflection on the theme of poetry collection. The poet suggests that meaning is beyond the boundaries of the structure of words. I have become dust, a figure formed from dust, I have become dust. This last line carries a philosophy in itself. Illusions of phenomenal world are shattered. The poet seeks to know the within, journey through physique towards metaphysical is felt in this poem. Of no fixed abode includes the feel of Shaloka 8 of Isha Upanishad. The particular shloka is description of the eternal, the nature of the self with capital S, can extend limitless. The poet wishes to explore the significance of self. He says that conscious doesn't require borders. He has located unclaimed places. These places are without biases, without ego, with no preferred direction. 
the poet loses trust in language as language is always subjective it is finite and the poet wants to know in finite language forces us to think in the division of us and them presence of other hinders the realization of within the poet writes to break man made boundaries the book is not about to be but becoming expanding going beyond where the arc of sea and sky are one voice arises strong imagery with the use of symbols the poet takes us to the voice within human beings are always attracted towards the emotion of wonder this curiosity of them imparts them the motivation to know the unknown a person who claims to know everything and the poet has used the word nazumi a beautiful word who knows everything he also fails as defined maps cannot take us to truth beyond the synonyms of emotions oblivion remains a state of trance is required to wander to know truth to know freedom the poetry of mohan rana ji reaches a point where the poet realizes that the truth leads to freedom and i think the two concepts are interrelated we can't find freedom without truth and without freedom we can't seek truth the photograph reminds us that nothing can be possessed a realization that everything is an image occurs i think the poet is in pain to see that the world has been divided into geographical boundaries waf and weft of earth is misleading it weaves the outside within is always in ignored an artist must stand outside life in order to portray it objectively and the poet has done it successfully to me after midnight is the last period of life there is a feeling that we are trapped in chakravyu repeating the same again and again there is an existential urge in the poem to know what exactly is truth there are rhetoric questions cognizance of consciousness is felt within words were washed away from your face the line tells us to be in the world of abstract the poem left us with silence beyond the words where everything is one the poet aspires to wash away the colors at a colors of attachment in the color of water one has to go beyond seasons to recognize oneself again and again there is a stress on the concept that meaning does not lie within the frame of words the poem not what the words explores this idea use of contradiction strengthen the theme of the poem dry in rain dazzles with the emptiness bridge that held apart are few to quote the last line of the poem is the climax that contains all the essence of life a seed somewhere is born out of that falling a beautiful line it is difficult to know life the poem as the past approaches the poet explores that truth is not in choosing one direction or the other the morning post compels us to go within everything that we wear in the name of identity is shallow vanity in the evening news and the roof of the world the most appealing line is we must get home before dark dark symbolizes material no matter how much we have we cannot touch stars meaning is driven through abstract the cartographer shows that it is impossible to make maps boundaries 
shift, geographies change, and trying to locate ourselves within. These shifting boundaries are left with nothing but fear. Map, which the poet suggests, is to know the emptiness. Fulfillment is not searching outside territories. It is within. It is beyond. It is yonder. It is not about the glories of exploration outside. The cartography is about finding black, blank spaces within. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Minnie Gill, for those remarks on the cartographer by Mr. Mohan Rana. Our next guest speaker joining us from France is Mr. Francois Matarasso, the honorary professor of the Robert Gordon University, Aberdeen, Scotland. Welcome, Mr. Francois Matarasso, for his remarks today. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be among such distinguished and eminent people today, but above all to pay tribute to my old friend Mohan Rana and his beautiful book, The Cartographer. A few months ago, I had a call from Mohan Rana. His calls tend to come out of the blue. They neither give nor need an introduction. We live far apart, but have been friends for 30 years. And our conversation is like a path that follows a river. Sometimes the land separates them, but when they reconnect, it's the same ground and the same water. Mohan wanted to ask my opinion about the title of a forthcoming collection of his poems translated into English. Over the next few days, we exchanged thoughts about 10 or a dozen possibilities, any of which, to be honest, would have been fine. Another word for it is very fitting for a book that makes Hindi and English embrace each other each time it is closed. Did you hear it too? Might be the unspoken thought that makes a poet pick up their pen. Personally, I've always loved A Standard Shirt, the poem which closes this book with its quiet moment of hopeful acceptance in which ordinary is enough and life, this life, is possible. At the end, as it at the start, the cartographer fitted best, like the final piece of a jigsaw puzzle, like one hand in another. It fits because Mohan Rana is the cartographer of a territory that gets too little attention. The space between and beyond those we claim and pretend to own in the everyday life of getting and spending, having and holding. He maps the space where nothing happens. You might think that in betweenness arises from the fact that Mohan lives in a different country to that of his birth and upbringing. In his words, resident of an unclaimed place with two windows, one on each side, looking out on two stateless places. It is a standard fact, common to so many lives, but one that defines a linguistic border that this poet has learned to make prosper like a smuggler, although his poetry is nothing if not above board. The past is a foreign country, writes L.P. Hartley in The Go-Between. They do things differently there. But Mohan is not a nostalgic poet. 
Indeed, sentimentality is absent from his poetry, and I can say from our years of friendship from his character too. He is not nostalgic, but his past is another country, even if it is one to which he always returns and where his poems are published and celebrated. Nevertheless, that removal is an ordinary fact, and anyone who uses a language away from its main current risks opening a gap between their private imagination and that of its community of speakers and writers. Perhaps that is why he writes, I have faith in poetry, but my trust in language is gone. I do not speak Hindi, but I trust the English translations so lovingly crafted by Lucy, Ro Lucy Rosenstein and Bernard O'Donoghue. In them, language releases its grip on chronology and geography. Timelessness is the quality I most often sense and value here. For all the specificity that allows the reader to see a robin, a parasol pine, or a yellow shirt, it is impossible to fix any of these poems to a year, a decade, or even a century. Nor do they bind themselves to a place, despite their roots in small and common things, such as a door, or a cloud, or a leaf. Indeed, Mohan has a rare ability to make simple nouns universal and abstract ones concrete, without ever losing the reader's confidence in the lived reality that is each poem's genesis. Mohan's concerns are not with the minutiae of the day's events or the constantly renewed feelings that blow through our minds. He is in search of deeper, more elusive ideas that touch on the nature and meaning of existence. That involves testing other borders than those humans make between countries or even languages. Nameless, invisible boundaries, as he puts it. Although I have little affinity for science myself, I have often been captivated by Mohan's exposition of new ideas in physics and the natural world, and his ease in bridging scientific and spiritual ways of apprehending reality. The American philosopher John D. Caputo writes that, the natural sciences give us causal explanations of mathematically measurable phenomena, while in the humanities, we reach an interpretive understanding of phenomena that have a non-mathematical meaning. Mohan Rana's poetry accommodates both these ways of understanding the world, declining politely to see any meaningful opposition between them. This ability to apprehend deep and unchanging truths in the specificity of things seen and felt is one of the most precious aspects of his poetry. W. H. Auden's dictum that poetry makes nothing happen is usually taken to express the political limitations of the art. But I prefer another interpretation. Nothing, like something, must happen somewhere and one of the places it comes into being is in Mohan Rana's extraordinary poetry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Francois Matarasso, for that deep insight on the cartographer by Mr. Mohan Rana. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, an author and educator from Durban, South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Uh, namaste. Hello uh, to my erstwhile 
group of panelists, as well as a special thanks once again to Yogi, Shristi, Piyush, and the team at the Swami Vivekananda Center for this opportunity to share some thoughts on a wonderful uh, book by Mohan Rana. Uh, I think, in all honesty, that the deep level of analysis has already been done by my <laughs> previous panelists, which makes my life a lot easier. I just want to say that in terms of literature in general, and this particular anthology of poems uh, by Mohan Rana in particular, as a piece of literature, it's, it's, it's an exceptional work of art. There's no, no doubt about that. But I just like to concentrate my comments, not so much on uh, Mohan himself, but on his audience, the reader. I think where Mohan comes from in his writing has been adequately explained already. But I'd like to comment as an ex-English teacher or a teacher of English at secondary schools where I had the privilege of teaching poetry on some of the technical aspects of his work. Because I think as all responsible people involved in literature, engaging in the production of a piece of literature is one thing, but motivating the reader to also express himself or herself through that type of forum, through that type of platform is also very important. And as a teacher of English, aspects. And so I'd like to concentrate on that because I believe to take Mohan's work further, it has to be brought to the audience. And the best audience would be, while we've got it at university level, would also be at school level to look at how a child can engage in this form of expression called poetry. Of course, with the help of a mentor like Rana himself. Basically, the, the title of the anthology, the cartographer, is very, very important in the sense that what is a cartographer? A person who creates maps. And if you look at this particular instance in the work of uh, Mohan himself, as a cartographer, he's collected and verified data and the maps that is created is that of life. He's used his words and his views and his assessment of life and created very geographically, I may add, this picture that people can relate to in the understanding of the message that he wants to impart. The content of his work in general, it's, it's very personal in nature, as has been mentioned by my panelists. It is indeed reflective. And I think from the reader's point of view, the simplicity of his language allows one in appreciating what he has written also to go deeper within oneself to ensure that the reader grasps the message that Rana is trying to place. And you'll realize that while uh, Mohan's written about himself and his experience as an Indian expat in a different country, there are millions like him. And I'd just like to say at this point in time, I've learned in his writing that you can take Mohan out of India, but you can't take India out of Mohan. And I think there are many people like that, which you know, uh, we can relate to. His work, the writing is very cathartic. It's really introspective. And I think that's a, a sign of very good literature, that it leaves the reader with something to take away from the writing. The philosophical content that promotes self-reflection on life has been adequately by my uh, fellow panelists and is very uh, prominent in the work itself. In terms of the writing style, and, and this is what I liked about it. You know, poetry doesn't have to be difficult and complex in terms of rhyme and rhythm, et cetera. Uh, Mohan's work is very easy in terms of its flow, its reading. I think the use of minimal punctuation, for example, is symbolic of allowing the mind to flow in the appreciation and analysis of each piece that is written. For example, if you look at uh, the poem, What is Seen, that comprises 12 lines and has two stanzas, but there are only two punctuation marks. And I think the verse, like his message and his mind and his thoughts, is actually free from restriction. And that's actually allows the tra traversing from the spiritual to the physical and vice versa. The personalized nature of the poem is also, uh, I think, a key point, it's a mood point, because he used the word I. And when the poet, like Rana, used the word I, so does the reader himself. 
and this allows for the self-reflection as spoke well about. And I like the fact that he speaks directly to the reader. If you look at the photograph, for example, I mean, like to quote, he says, the love inside you takes you on an unfamiliar path and the truth releases you. A, a line like that immediately takes the words away from the page, but to the mind of the reader himself. Similarly, in the shades of the parasol price, he says, I don't remember your face anymore. Well, what does that mean? It means you're one of many, but in the same vein, how many of us in life go through that? And if you think about life in general, at a particular moment in time, something is very important to us. In 10 years time, some moments remain and some don't, you know, but it also highlights the transitory nature of our physical life. And I think, again, the message coming through in most, if not all of Rana's poems is the transitory nature of life and how life is more than just the physical. It is the physical, the spiritual and the beyond. I like his use of imagery in terms of personification. There's a lot of personification. Those that come to mind right now are in uh, his form of no fixed abode. He says, spring quietly opens the parcel now. It's such a beautiful five word comment, you know? And uh, it, it, it creates this image in your mind of spring being a person that's actually unparceling or, or opening what spring brings with it. In Did You Hear It Too? He used the words, all night long, your restlessness, unable to sleep, walked and peered with eyes closed inside me. Can you imagine this beautiful image of you, the person, but within you, like your lifeblood, something is moving and nurturing itself. He uses a lot of the rhetorical questions as well. Uh, does the fish too drink water in after midnight? Does the sun feel the heat? Does the light see the dark? All these things actually ask us to sit back and reflect on the reality of life and also to assess those that we take granted. And as the past approaches, he reads, out or in, this side or the other, closed or open, who's waiting for me there? Whom am I waiting for? Those lines actually pick out the essence of life itself. I'd like to conclude with just a few comments more. Just as the cartographer collects information to charter a course, so does Rana himself collate, analyze, assess, and pilot the course of life amongst as well as the year after. His ability to experience his motherland despite one another is reminiscent of the many millions of people in the same situation. You can take Mohan out of India, as I said, but you cannot take India out of Mohan. His work nudges us to assess the transitory nature of it, removing the physical and spiritual boundaries, thinking beyond the present and mundaneness of life. Such transversal moment with removal of physical and spiritual boundaries brings to the fore the concept of memory, its importance when spanning borders, and the possibility of its inability to part with the physical. In Crossing Over, which I would just like to read in conclusion, it sums up belief in the oneness of the physical, spiritual, and natural world. What indeed is the true meaning of life? And please allow me just to read Crossing Over for my father. I have been in the past myself, but I will still forget everyone. Now I hear everything, having become the music of the spheres, and I can see far away now. I am the horizon. Having gone so far, no pace perceived. I'm so close to you. I share your bread. A figure formed from dust. I have become dust. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, for your magnetic insight on the cartographer. We've come to a very interesting part of the program where I'd like to invite Mr. Mohan Rana and Mr. Francois Matarasso to uh, recite a few poems uh, from the cartographer. Mr. Mohan Rana will be reciting the poems in Hindi and thereby Mr. Francois Matarasso in English translation. Welcome, Mr. Mohan Rana and Mr. Francois Matarasso. <laughs> Thank you, Srishti. Um, I thank all the panelists for their uh, inspiring for me, uh, positive comments. Um, I think it'll help me motivate and explore further um, this 
space inside and outside. Um, once again, I thank you. Before I finish my reading, I thank everybody here for their presence, for being here, and I'm very humble. अपनी कही बात उन्होंने कहा न जाओ दुनिया के छोर तक डर जाओगे अपनी लंबी परछाई को देख उस पार पंखों वाले असगरों की दुनिया है उनकी उगलती आग में आग से उजली धरती जहां न रात है न दिन अगर तुम पहुंचे तो राह देखते पत्थर में बदल जाओगे जैसे किसी और से सुनी हो या अपनी ही कही बात जीवन में रिहर्सल की संभावना होती तो लिख रखे हैं पटकथा में कुछ परिवर्तन टाल नहीं सकता अपनी कही बात लौटना जाना तुमसे प्रेम करना ना लिखे कई दिनों तक पर मैं भला ना था बुरे दिनों को जीते मैं बुरा होता रहा मैं समय की तरह अगोचर हो गया घड़ी में घूमता लगातार अपनी ही कही किसी बात से सनकाया सा थैंक यू इन योर ओन वर्ड्स said don't go to the end of the earth because your lengthening shadow will frighten you there it is the world of winged pythons the earth there is ablaze with the fire they spit if you arrive when it is neither day nor night you'll be turned into stone while you are waiting as if i had heard these words of mine from somebody else if i'd had a full life rehearsal i'd have made some changes to the text but i can't get away from my own words returning going away loving you but i wasn't good enough i couldn't write for days living in evil times i turned evil not seeing time passing i became imperceptible as if trapped in clockwork driven crazy by my own words thank you chatnar chir ki chhaya mein thak kar baith jati hai dopahar इन बिसूरती गर्मियों एड्रियाटिक की मंथर करवटें मैं भूल जाना चाहता हूं वे सारे वायदे तपते भूगोल की त्वचा पर गुमसुम मुझे मालूम है वे पूरे नहीं हो सकते कि वे झूठ हैं कि वह सच है मेरा ही अपना कि मैं आश्वस्त करता हूं खुद को ही कि मैं कि बेचैन सरसर हवा में पकता तैयार हो रहा है पज्जर जुलाई के धूसरित कदमों अपनी भाषा से मिला मुझे एक शब्दकोश जिसमें प्रेम के कई पूरक हैं उतने ही भय के उसके मुड़े तुड़े पन्नों में अपने चेहरे की रेखाओं में एक पहचान पर तुम्हारा नाम याद नहीं आता अब इन शेड ऑफ दाइन इन द्रीवस बाई दिंग वेव्स ऑफ दिक I want to forget those empty promises burned onto the quiet contours of the skin. I know 
that they will never become real. And the only truth is this restless, rustling air. As I remind myself, Pythons under the arid footpaths of July. In the dictionary of my private language, there are enough entries, love and fear, and well thumbed pages to make plain the lines of my aging face, even though I don't remember your face anymore. Thank you. Nakshanavis. Pantiyon ke beech anupasthit ho. Tumhe khamosh pehchan. Jaise bhatakte badlo mein anupasthit barish. Tum anupasthit ho jeevan ke har rikt sthan mein. समय के अंतराल में इन आतंकित गलियों में मैं देखता नहीं किसी खिड़की की ओर रुकता नहीं किसी दरवाजे के सामने देखता नहीं घड़ी को सुनता नहीं किसी पुकार को बदलती हुई सीमाओं के भूगोल में मेरा भय ही मेरे साथ है Thank you very much. The cartographer. Between the lines, it's you. Absent, but a silent presence, just as the rain is absent in the passing cloud. There you are, absent, in every empty space of life. In every gap of time, on these panic-stricken roads, I don't look out any window, don't stop at any door, I don't watch the clock, I hear no one's call. As geography changes its borders, fear is my sole companion. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mohan Rana and Mr. Francois Matarasso for that beautiful recitation. I would like to now introduce Mr. CPM Chunu from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban to render this afternoon's vote of thanks. Namaskar. Greetings to all of you. On behalf of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Devon, I am so delighted today to deliver a vote of thanks on today's episode 6 of the program Pustakalog, meaning Light of the Book. Today's discussion was about the book called The Cartographer, authored by Sri Mohan Ranaji from England. Allow me to thank the following online guest who gave remarks about the book and also they gave the recitation of poems on today's program. Sri Mohan Ranaji is the author of this wonderful book. Danya Bhatse, thank you very much for this wonderful book. Dr. Rem Prasad Bhatji, a faculty member at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Miss Mini Gill, Assistant Professor at the Department of English at Sri Aurobindo College at the University of Delhi in India. Mr. Franco Materasso, an honorary professor at Robert Gordon University, Abadir in Scotland. Lastly, to Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, an author and educator in South Africa. To Director of Swami Viveka, Nanda Cultural Center, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Sristi Hari Narayan, Sri Piyush Kandelwal, 
Thank you very much, Dania Bhatt, for taking part on today's program. To our online viewers who participated, I'd like to say to all of them, Dania Bhatt, thank you very much. Please visit our Facebook page for upcoming cultural programs that are organized by Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center. To all of you, once again, Sri Mohan Ranaji, Dr. Rem Prasad Badji, Miss Mini Gilji, Mr. Francois Materasoji, and Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singhji. Danyabad to all of you. Thank you for having time with us. Once again, to all of you, have a wonderful evening. Namaskar.